So that's here to say, you know, I'm not saying that like, you know, we're all great at these things and it's all really easy, but it is, I do think it really helps because, you know, sometimes you go to bed at night and you just can't sleep. What's happening? Your head's busy. You've got these thoughts. You're thinking about that tiger and it's going round and round your head and you get anxious and then you can't sleep and then you go, oh my God, I'm not coping because I can't sleep. What am I going to do? And then you pace or you do whatever and then you're tired and cranky the next day. And so some of these strategies can be quite useful for simple things like that, to recognise why am I feeling this way? What is going on in my head? What's going on in my body? What am I doing that is helping or hindering me? And how am I feeling? And then from that you can work out some strategies to help you. It doesn't mean that you never get anxious or sad or any of those things, but it's just some strategies that can work. Oops, that's it touchy little button. Okay, so common experiences after a cancer diagnosis, and these just come from, there's been, you know, gazillions of studies, not really a word, but I'll use it anyway. Lots of studies asking people with cancer how they feel, what's bothering them, and what we know is that it's a pretty normal reaction to feel anxious or depressed when you're, you know, sad when you're diagnosed with cancer. Sad's probably a better word than depressed because there's a difference between feeling sad and feeling clinically depressed or clinically anxious, of course. Feeling angry, in shock, feeling tearful and crying at oddest moments for no reason that you can tell. Withdrawing and just not wanting to talk to anyone at all and charging off on your own and being confused. And I'm sure you could add to the list. You all must have long lists and, and recollections of times when you've just felt so sad and so lost and, and so it's, it's pretty common. So the point of that slide is just to say this is a hard experience. Cancer is really tough and so if you've been feeling upset and worried that's a really normal thing. The important thing though is that if you are feeling upset and worried and it's just going on and on and on and it's getting you down is that you should talk to your doctor about that, your GP or your urologist or someone like that to say, you know what, I knew that this would be tough and I knew that I would feel bad, but I'm just not in control of it and I'm not getting over it and get, get some extra help for that. And I think it's really important to put your hand up when you feel, if you feel you're in that situation. Oh, that is such a touchy button. So, so this is just reinforcing, I guess, the point I made earlier that everybody responds to the challenge of a diagnosis in a different way. They all do different things. You know, some people are, are more fighters, want to get out there, I'm going to fight this thing, I'm going to do this and that. And other people are more withdrawing and quiet. Um, some people like to talk a lot to others about their experience and some people don't. There's no um, rule book for the right and the wrong way to cope with a diagnosis of prostate cancer. Whether you're a partner or whether you're a man, it's, it's all different. We all have ways that we know work for us. The one thing, though, that I would say is that what we do know is that if you're flexible and you've got a number of coping strategies, that's a good thing. Because there'll be situations you face that you haven't faced before and if you've only got two main things that you do and they don't work, you can feel like you're in a bit of trouble. So an example of that is that if you're getting a nasty injection or something that hurts done to you, it's quite useful to pretend you're somewhere else to close your eyes, to visualise that you're in the forest or you're wherever and to pretend you're somewhere else because that's a short-term painful experience and if you distract yourself and avoid that in your head, that can help get you through. And in fact, they train people to do that um, for certain procedures. But that's not a helpful thing to do if you sit down with your partner and someone says, we've just got to talk about this, I'm not here. I'm in the forest <laughs> by the sea and <laughs> that coping strategy is not going to end well, I predict, in that circumstance. That's when a different coping strategy might be helpful. So I think one thing you can do is think of ways to cope as tools in your toolbox and if you've only got one or two main things that you do, you might want to think about whether you could develop some extra ones. If your main thing to do to cope with stuff is to get out and you know, run a long distance or do some physically hard work and then you're not well enough to do that, you'll need another coping strategy. So just think about whether for you, if you've been feeling, having a bit of a tough time, you might think about, is there something else I could learn that I could have a play with and apply to help myself? So I'm just going to talk about partners for a minute and this is something that you know David and Pam and I have talked about quite a bit because what happens in the hospitals often, 
not always, but often, is that the focus is all on the patient. And that's understandable. It's the patient that they're trying to treat. That's the person who's got to agree to the procedures and sign the consent forms and have all these things done to them. And that's the person that they monitor. It's not that common for people to think about the carer or the partner or even the close family. And it's actually important that we do. The studies in prostate cancer consistently show, for example, that partners often report higher levels of distress than do men, which is a curious thing, you'd think. But in a way, it's not curious because partners are often really worried about the man, concerned about him, feeling a bit helpless, not sure what to do, and that can be really driving them up the wall. Um, and of course, it's everyone's stressed, it's hard to talk about it, and so that's one possible reason. Um, but I think it's important to acknowledge that when cancer happens in a family, it affects everybody. It doesn't just affect the, the well-being of the person with cancer. And then within the couple, what we think is that how each person is coping affects the other. And there's not been that much work done on prostate cancer in this, but there's been work done in other areas. So that often you hear people talk about that sometimes one person in the relationship sucks up the emotional negativity, so plays the role of, of trying to manage the level of distress in the family unit. Um, and that could be the man or that could be the woman. I mean, they typically say it's the woman, but I know lots of cases where I can see that's the man as well. So one person might play that role and that has a, can have an emotional cost for them. And that if one person in the relationship is really distressed, that can lead to distress for the other. So looking after both people is really important for both of them. Um, so that's what it says there, one person taking on the role of emotional man manager. And typical patterns of communicating or solving problems may or may not be helpful. And I guess what I'm saying there again harks back to if what's typically happened, because you know, people tell me these things often, they'll say, well, you know, when Jim would get really distressed, typically he'd just go for a run, he'd blow off steam. We wouldn't discuss it particularly because we knew that things would be better the next day and we just got past it that way. But now we can't do his usual blowing off steam thing. He's like a bear with a sore head and he's driving me up the wall. And um, I think, you know, it, a diagnosis of cancer puts additional strain and stress on a couple. There's difficult things to deal with. And so this can make, it could be that your typical patterns of solving problems might not work or they might work really well. You know, some couples find they sit down, they talk about it, they work it out. It doesn't mean that you're not a great couple if you're having challenges with this though. And I think that's important to um, be comfortable about saying, this is a bit tough. I could do with some help with this. So this is a quote from, I'm doing a study at the moment, well we've just finished recruitment, we have 190 couples in this study and we're looking at different way to, ways to help couples cope with prostate cancer and so people tell us lots of stories and, and lots of things about how they're going. So this is one quote and it's about the coping difficult, differently thing. So we've been married for a long time, we've had our differences, I'm the type who wants to talk about it and Dave just wants to fix it. So. I can see some of you are looking at each other and giggling, and so I know this is not an uncommon scenario. <laughs> when he came home, he was struggling, but he wouldn't complain. And I was putting on a brave face and then running around my sister to have a cry and a whinge. And, and you know, so they muddled through, but it could have worked on it together, and it would have been a bit easier for both of them, would be my point. And I was thinking, the reason why you have a picture of a giraffe in front of you is I was thinking about when I was pulling this talk together about, you know that book, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus? You know the older I get, the more I think that is so true. <laughs> I do. But then I thought, well, I can't steal that line. So I thought, well, maybe men are giraffes and women are zebras. And so the reason why I said that was because giraffes tend to be, you see them in the jungle, they're more sort of solitary, whereas zebras run in flocks. And so, and they seem to chat to each other, I think, when I was in the jungle. So there's your bloke running off, being problem focused, and there's the zebras having a talk to each other. That was just like me. <laughs> you see, I knew that someone in the audience would connect with that slide. So they're both lovely animals, but they're both quite different. And I think that's what I think about men and women. They're both lovely animals, but they're both quite different. Oh, so let's leave talking about stereotypes about what men and women are like and getting myself into trouble and move on to what are some of the challenges that a couple will face when coping with prostate cancer. So the first one is making decisions about treatment. Really, hard, I mean, I'm assuming that most of you are through that, but you might face future decisions or you might be right in the middle of it. The first um, 
big study I did in prostate cancer, I went and visited 111 men with prostate cancer in their homes and I asked them to tell me how they made a decision about prostate cancer and I taped it and I analysed it later. And I remember one fellow in particular, so I would come in, I would, I would always meet the, the partners because they would, if he had one, because they would be there. And um, we would have a cup of tea together and then I would have to shoo the lady out of the room because I needed him to tell me what was really going on on his head, not what he wanted her to go on his head. And, <laughs> and it was really true that that was the case. And there was one particular couple, they were just lovely. And uh, I shooed the wife out and um, we sat and chatted. And so he looked to check that she wasn't there and he said, right, well, she thinks I'm undecided, but I'm going to have surgery. I knew I was having surgery the minute the doctor opened his mouth and told me that I had cancer, but I want her and all the family to think that I'm really thinking this through. <laughs> but then what was really sweet though was when she came back, he said, because he, he felt like he'd confessed to me, had to confess to her, so it was a big <laughs> truth-telling session. And she was fine with him having surgery. You know, she was actually relieved that he'd made a decision. She was trying to be supportive and, give him all his options and say whatever he chose, she'd be there with him. But um, they just hadn't talked about it because they were worried about upsetting each other. So making decisions about treatment can be stressful for both the man and for his partner. Getting through treatment makes sense that, that that is a hard, tough time and it's all very acute and you can get very focused on just coping with the acuteness of that. Because if you're in hospital and you come out, you're pretty crook, takes a bit to get over that and get back on your feet again. If you've got radiation therapy, there's all the side effects that go with that. Um, and what I've found with couples is that uh, often they find that it's not until the getting on with life stage that they really, it really starts to hit home. Because if we're trying to make the decision, I'm focused on that. And if I'm trying to get through treatment, I'm focused on that. And then when we're adjusting and working these side effects out, at least the urinary side effects, that's our big issue. And then suddenly we realise that things that there are some things in our relationship in our sexual relationship that are permanently different now or appear that they could be permanently different and we never really thought through what that was going to be like and that can be a real challenge that comes later. I say that on the basis of the study that we've got 190 couples in it. We, we've had a tough time getting the couples to really engage with sexuality issues early on because they really don't want to a lot of them just don't want to think about it early, they just want to get through this business and then think about it later and then it comes home to roost. So there are multiple challenges that you face, a lot of them are acute, but then when you get on to four, it's about the getting on with life, it's about looking forward and saying, okay, so what's my goal going to be for the way I want my life to be from now on? What are we going to focus on as a couple? Or as an individual, what am I going to focus on and how are we going to move forward? And I think that's probably um, one of the most challenging things. So I really like this because it's, you know, sometimes that's what we act like that's true. Oh, just pull yourself together. You know, we, try, we say it to ourselves more than we say it to anybody else when we're distressed or we're struggling. We try and kick ourselves up the bottom and say, just pull yourself together. And, it's not so helpful when things are a bit overwhelming. You know, it can, I mean, it's okay for if you're just being crabby about a little minor thing, but for serious things, just pull yourself together. I don't think it's the best way. I think there are some more, more productive things that you can do.